So welcome everybody to McGill Scientific Writing Initiatives uh, last workshop of 2020 and we're working in collaboration with MSurge and SRI just to repeat. Uh, it is Friday, November 6th, 5 p.m. So we'll get started. Um, introducing our guest speaker today, it's Monica. Uh, she completed her Bachelor's of Science at McGill in 2020 and then she is currently doing her uh, Master's in Oxford. And she's very passionate about higher education, accessibility, psychiatry, and neuroscience. So we're really excited to have her speak today uh, on the topics of, um, well, in general, just science communication, but specifically we're going to address writing personal statements. So it's really important now, especially everyone's submitting those personal statements for applications. So listen up. Thanks, Thanks for the intro. So yeah, like Sydney said, my name is Monica. I'm currently a grad student at Oxford. I'm studying clinical neuroscience. So today, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to begin with just a really brief and general overview of what a personal statement is. I'm then going to walk you through step by step how I approach the personal statement from when I made up my school list to when I actually submit it. Then I'm going to talk about um, an example of a personal statement, and then we can kind of keep it interactive and talk about the pros, the cons, what could be improved, etc. And finally, I'm going to finish off with a question and answer period. But if you have any questions throughout, just feel free to unmute and just ask it. It's good that way. And yeah, so the next slide, please. So yeah, the personal statement. What is a personal statement, right? A personal statement is just a piece of writing that goes along with your other application materials. So things like a research proposal and a CV. And the goal of the personal statement is to inform admission committees about your academic interests, your research experience, and your career objectives. It's generally 500 to 1,000 words long, so it's important to be picky and selective about what you choose and make sure that it aligns with whatever program that you want to apply to. And the two ways I like to think of it is that it's a good way for admission committees to know whether your experiences and your interests align with the program. Because ultimately, I think it's all about fit and whether what you want out of the program aligns with the kind of students that they want to attract. So that's one aspect of it, but more importantly, the other aspect of it is also to see whether that program is right for you. Because I think oftentimes when we have ideas of what we want to pursue, it's different to have that idea and it's, even, it's another level to actually be able to express that and write in words why you're passionate about something and why you want to pursue it. So I know writing personal statements can be a really daunting task, but just framing it as something that a good opportunity for you to also reflect on what you want beyond that graduate school program is also uh, a less stressful way to think about it. And with that, I think it's also important to stress that this is an academic piece of writing, despite the words personal statement. So you want to keep the tone more academic focused, especially if it's for a research master's or a master's that has a research component, because I think that's one of the most important things they look for after the GPA. And also, along with that, I'd like to say that my experience that I'll be presenting to you today really comes from applying to schools in the United Kingdom. So I'm aware that there are significant differences of schools in the UK versus schools in the North American systems, being that um, in North America, it's more about like personal development, personal growth, and there's an emphasis on that. I think sometimes there's literally a question about like what you learned or things like that. Whereas in the UK, they really just want that academic sense and that academic tone to be conveyed. And that's something I think I wish I knew earlier on, but yeah, so I think it's good to note. And yeah, so that's about the personal statement. We can go to the next slide, please. So in terms of the step-by-step -step approach of how to approach the personal statement, 
what I did was first I came up with the idea that I wanted to go to grad school and then I came up with a school list. Oftentimes I think people pick like five to 15 schools. I think I have about five schools, which you'll see later on the presentation. So I created an Excel doc and I just listed the schools. And then from there, I wanted to know exactly what the school was looking for. And I'll be talking to you about that. After that, I divided it sort of like the personal statement process into before writing it. So the planning that goes involved with, goes involved within it, um, actually writing it, and the most important part, which is editing it. And throughout this whole entire process, of course, it's important to note that the mindset or your mindset really shapes your thoughts. So it, it's good to try to have a positive mindset going into it, especially since it is a long process. Um, but know that, you know, there is going to be a good outcome at the end. It's helpful. So yeah, we can go to the next slide, please. I just have a quick question. Yeah. So in terms of knowing what school you want to apply to, you mentioned five to 15. That seems like so many. How, how do you narrow down uh, like which ones are a priority or are you allowed to apply to just any school for most programs uh, alongside one another? Or is it like you're not allowed to apply to one if you've applied to another? Um, for the grad programs, I believe that you can apply to many schools, as many as you want. It just depends on like application fees on that end. Um, for, I guess no one's here is going to do a second undergrad, but if you are looking at doing a second undergrad, I know that Oxbridge does not allow you to apply to, um, if you apply to Oxford, I don't think you apply to Cambridge, something like that. But for grad schools, I don't think there's a restriction. So the only thing would just be application fees and time. So in terms of prioritizing the school, I would look at the selectivity because I wouldn't want to just put all my time into preparing for very, very competitive schools. Um, so make a list of like uh, reach schools, target schools, and like schools that you're pretty confident getting in and then pick maybe like three reach schools or um, and then just allocate accordingly depending on how much time you have. So that's how I would prioritize it. But ultimately it's fit, right? Like if you think that you sort of will not like the program, then I probably wouldn't apply anyway. Um, so that's fit, um, time, selectivity, and cost. Hope that answered the question. Perfect, thanks. So yeah, this was my school list. Um, I applied to five. Or, yeah, uh, those schools. Uh, basically, I think it's really good to have a an Excel document with all your schools, or you can use Notion as well. I think Notion's quite good. But basically, I have my school in one column, and then whether I started or not. So that was like motivation for me to actually start um, when I wanted to complete my personal statement by, and whether I followed up with my reference. Um, my profs who gave me recommendation letters and whether my results, which I think you can all see. <laughs> um, so in terms of the timeline to get references, I think any time between two to four weeks is good. Um, anytime earlier is also okay, but I think it's easy for them to forget and sometimes just pestering them with emails is probably not the best thing to do. So I'd say two to four weeks is good. Um, but even mentioning them, mentioning to them that you have an idea or the intention of applying somewhere can be good because they can also provide you with some um, help on that. But anyway, um, going back to like the preparation step. Yeah, so I thought about whether I want to apply to grad school. I decided whether I want to do a master's or a PhD, and then I made this school list here. Um, and from that, we are going to use the first school as an example throughout the presentation. Um, because that's where I am at now. And I think it's useful so just to have like a concrete example to walk you through this entire process. So yeah, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is um, the prompt that I had to work with. And I think it's important to have a prompt to work off of. And if you don't, then feel free to actually email the ad comms and to ask them what kind of thing are you looking for? Because if you don't have something specific, it can kind of be, I think, disorganized or a bit chaotic. So it's important to have specific things of what they are looking for. And so for me, 
before I even wrote the personal statement, I thought and I wrote out um, for each of these points how I could, what I could do and what I could say to demonstrate that. For example, I understand my reasons of applying, et cetera, et cetera. So because these points are generally touched upon in other personal statements as well, and I think it's nice to include, I'll just walk you through some of the points that I said for each of these and hopefully it'll give you some inspiration. So in terms of reasons for applying, I just said that I took a course called the NAT321 with Dr. Rigsdale and he inspired me to pursue a career or a graduate studies in neuroscience because that was something I never even thought of before. And I really enjoyed the clinical aspects of the course and how he made it really relevant to clinical populations. So I had like a few sentences about that in the beginning of my personal statement. And in terms of evidence of understanding of the proposed area of study, I think the best thing to do is to actually look at the course syllabus, like the detailed course syllabus of the program you want to apply to and actually draw upon some of the points that they have there and relate it to your experiences. And actually putting that in your personal statement is a good indication for adcoms to know that you actually took the time to look through each of the modules and that you have some understanding rather than just vague statements. And so for me, I talked about how their course structure, which was a mix of lectures and research, really paralleled what I was used to at McGill. So because I did honors, I had a project to do alongside my five courses that I took. And that closely parallels what I have to do right now. So just being able to do that while at McGill indicates to the adcoms that I'm able to manage my time and to organize my life around that. In terms of showing commitment to the subject, I think the best way to show this is through your extracurriculars. So I really talked about my entrance into the field of med sci um, and my interest in it through my involvement with medical direction, which has been very, very helpful. So shout out to them. And also through my shadowing and hospital volunteering positions. So that's what I talked about there. And I linked it back to of course, clinical neuroscience, because that was my program that I applied to. And in terms of showing and demonstrating preliminary knowledge of the subject, I think just talking about specific areas of the classes that you took could be quite useful. So again, I just went back to talking about NAT321 and some of my side courses I took. Um, and I think this is probably the most important part if you are applying to something that has a strong or heavy research component to really stress research throughout the personal statement. So this ties well into the capacity for sustained and intense work. So if you are taking a um, 396 course or similar equivalent ones, or if you're an honor student, just use that experience and really talk about it in more detail because it really is a year long commitment. It's a lot of time. And it really shows, you know, scientific communication skills, organizational skills, and all these things that you probably won't be able to show to like typical extracurriculars. And it's quite unique. So that also ties in well with the ability to absorb new ideas because, you know, for research, there isn't often a clear answer. And there's a lot of thought and planning that has to go into it. So just being able to draw on the experiences that you had in undergrad and tie it into each of these points very, very explicitly, I think is a good approach to take. Um, but of course, it can differ based on the program you're applying to. So I would go through this process um, for every single school that you do. And yeah, next slide, please. I have another question. Yeah. Um, in terms of the commitment to the subject, you mentioned adding some information about extracurriculars. Um, and things that you do outside of school. What about other work that you've had? I know a lot of, uh, I've heard different perspectives about whether you should add um, work experience outside of research, let's say, um, to show that, you know, commitment to a job, but I'm not sure how much that would apply here. What, what do you think? Yeah, I actually talked to the, um, the pre-med advisor or the med advisor here at Oxford because someone asked the exact same question for med apps and she was saying that it's really really great to include even if it's not research as long as it's really relevant to whatever program you want to do um so an example was 
um, someone wanted to apply to medicine, hence the medicine support group, and they were asking whether their role of vice president of welfare would be related to showing commitment because it wasn't research exactly. And her response was, you know, it's really great. And even though it's not exactly research, it's still good to include because it's very relevant. So it's just, it can be anything as long as it's relevant. I hope that helps. Um, I have a question as well, if you don't mind. Yeah. I actually am seeing now kind of sounds like one that's in the chat. Um, when you're, when you're writing your personal statement and they've given you these guidelines, to what extent do you want to match the, the words that they're using? Or do you want to, like, do you want to say, oh, I, you know, I have, you know, I, I'm really committed to this subject of work, or do you want to be a little bit more vague about it and hope that they'll understand that that's what you were implying in the paragraph about the work that you've done? Like, should you be really explicit or more implicit? Um, personally, I went the more explicit route, and that's the feedback the feedback I got from my professors who read my edited versions, because originally it was quite implicit. I thought like through showing research, this would demonstrate that. Um, but my profs really appreciated just having that written out. But of course, I wouldn't do like, oh, these are my reasons of applying. Next sentence, my evidence for understanding, like, you know, like make it flow, but make it explicit, if that makes sense. So. Yeah, and I think for some points, like for example, I, I even skipped over the point of your ability to present a coherent case in, in proficient English, right? Some of them is quite obvious, so you can just like, just not favor those. But for the ones that are less obvious, I would definitely just point it out, especially for UK schools, because it's very um, clear cut and there's very specific things that they want. Okay, thank Any you. Any other questions? I'm looking at the chat. Yeah, I see it now. Um, let me just close the chat so I can see my window. Okay, so yeah, um, this is the outline that I made. Of course, the words are not there, but it's like an uh, example of what I would do for approaching the thing. So for criteria one, for example, it would be like reasons for applying, and that would put several examples. So when I actually write it, it's easier for me to pick and select like which one's the most relevant so you can actually include like many different examples even ones that overlap and then when you write just kind of see which best fits with whatever point you want to make so yeah that's the approach i would do before even writing the personal statement um yeah and the next slide please um yeah so i guess i wanted to ask you all what is your approach in writing the personal statement how do you how do you view writing the personal statement? Like, what would you do? Just open up to anyone who wants to ask or say anything. I mean, I can, I can start. I feel like my main approach would be to put myself in the shoes of the person reading it and think, what would I want from an applicant? And then coming back in my own shoes and thinking, what about me stands out? And try to emphasize those points. Yeah, I think that's really, really great, especially because the ad column people are people after all. I think sometimes it's just easy to forget, but they all, they often have opinions on things and um, just trying to imagine yourself in their shoes is really good. I, I think coming from America where we had the Common App, um, a huge issue I have actually writing my personal statement for grad school and especially for international schools is that like in America, you, they really emphasize the quirky, almost personality type of storytelling to your personal statement. Whereas I find a lot of the Canadian and UK schools do seem to be more erring on the side of, we just want your experience, not necessarily your stories. So it's hard to balance. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I definitely understand because I wrote the Common App. I, I went through the Common App essay um, I think one of the prompts was like, tell us about something that like changed your life or something like that. <laughs> so going into the grad school process, I kind of kept that mentality, not knowing that, like you said, the UK is more like, tell us what you did. Um, so I think it's just something important to remember. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, anyone else? If not, then... I can tell you my approach in the next slide, which is sort of, I, I kind of think of it in two ways. Um, the first part is the practical part, um, which is 
before writing, I want to make sure that I have enough time. Um, so I like to schedule smaller chunks of time over long periods of, you know, of time. So I think, for example, writing your personal statement for 15 hours over five days is better than 15 hours over one day, because if you get sleep, um, you can come back with like a fresh mindset and then kind of read it. And then you probably notice a lot more things, a lot of things that you would have said differently. Whereas if you just write in one day, it's kind of hard to do that. Um, and like I said earlier, it's just an important mindset to have that it's a way to improve writing skills and a good way to force yourself to do some self-reflection and introspection rather than thinking of it as like a be all end all, like this will make or break your app because you know, if you're less stressed then you can come up with more ideas and like really enjoy the process more. Um, so yeah, that's for that slide. And this is when I'm actually writing the personal statement. Like this is what I was thinking. I think it's the most important thing I would say is to convey a story. Um, I think someone raised their hand so you can. Yeah, I just have a question, like going back to that anecdotal type thing, like when they say what inspired you to get into this program or what motivated you about this program, like I feel like saying I'm interested in this topic is not enough, like like giving a story like oh so, like one of my friends has been diagnosed with cancer and just motivated me to get in there and start doing research on that that sounds a lot better than i'm interested in just studying cancer how do i make like something as effective as an argument in that without like you know a story <laughs> like i don't i don't know if i'm asking like a clear question do you understand what i'm saying so do you think you can like rephrase this? So is it just like the balance of like, you mean the balance of tone versus um, conveying a clear theme? I think how do I um, differentiate myself from the rest of the group without having like a story like that, you know? Yeah, I think it just comes down to, I mean, to knowing that the personal statement is just like one aspect of the whole application package. Cause like ultimately they have your grades and they have, probably a research proposal as well. Um, but in terms of differentiating yourself with a personal statement, it just comes down to your, the experiences that you provide because I mean, probably the way you write it also, um, but it's harder to sort of differentiate if you're not like telling, you know, like a sob story, for example, right? If it's just like straight to the point. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from. Um, but I think it's ultimately just going to be the experiences that you write and that you share and how it relates and your overall, I guess, thesis statement that you want to convey. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> but yeah, just, just to have a good, clear um, and concise thesis statement is good. So for example, like going to the first point, it's like when the person reads your personal statement, what is the one thing you want them to remember about you? And for me, I really wanted to share my interest in clinical neuroscience and psychiatry and specifically the links between those two. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted them to remember. And I think to differentiate yourself, if you think of a theme sort of like that, um, that is probably going to be different from someone else, then that could be a good way to differentiate yourself. And on that note, it's also good to know that it's not a resume so I mean I made the mistake earlier on of just like listing the things that I did rather than actually explain what I learned from them because they have your resume so they can just kind of see anyway and also I think I heard from actually my career advisor was telling me how don't include stuff that's like not on your CV or like just don't include like random stuff so if you had a really great um, experience I don't know like at a hospital make sure it's on your cv as well otherwise people are going to be like where did that come from i think that's just like a general tip that i got that i found really useful from my career advisor like two weeks ago um and the second point yeah they aren't admitting you for what you've done but they kind of use that as a predictor of your potential and what you're going to do in the future um, i mean all schools want to know whether you're a good fit and whether you'll bring them or you'll be an asset in some way shape or form so just framing that and having the mindset of, okay, I'm, I'm selecting this activity to highlight 
because of a specific reason, whether it's to show your communication skills or your collaboration skills or something like that. Make sure it's everything that you write and every sentence and every word has a purpose. And so it really is a good question to ask yourself. First of all, how does what how is the experience I'm trying to show um, fit into their program? And how does that really reinforce your thesis statement or your story that you want to share throughout? And of course, the last point when I'm actually going to write my personal statement is that I want to expect many iterations, which is why I want to start earlier, because for me, I actually had 15 different um, versions. So it takes quite a lot of time um, to finally arrive at something that I'm happy with. So yeah, that's that. And we can talk about the editing phase now on the next slide. There was just a question about um, in terms of a self-reflection uh, concept, how do, do you have any advice about how to do this self-reflection? Do you suggest speaking with family members or friends or kind of just spending that time thinking about yourself and what you want for yourself and your experiences? Any advice about that? Yeah, like how to self-reflect. I think for me, I really benefited from journaling and mindfulness. I think those have been just life-changing um, in general. And being able to actually write down, like, this is how I feel about this program. This is how I feel that it aligns with my future goals and my future ambition is a good way to do it. Also talking with family members, of course, and also talking to CAPS. I don't know if many of you have used them, but they have been so, so helpful for me, um, when, especially when I was deciding whether or not to switch into STEM. They gave me a very good kind of way. They, they asked me really good questions and that got me to think. And then when I wrote about them in my journal, I was like, oh my goodness, this is like what I want to do. Um, and I think they're really helpful. So if you, if you want some other routes for self-reflection, definitely reach out to CAPS. Can you just uh, explain what that is? Oh, it's a career planning service at McGill. I think you can just like make a appointment with them. But yeah, I had an appointment with, I had many appointments with them actually. I think honestly, like probably once a week for like a solid three months because I was like not sure um, what I wanted to do at that point. And I think it's quite normal for many undergrads or even grad students to not sh be sure of what they want and just having someone to talk um, to and kind of ask questions that things I never would have thought of um, is a good way to do it. Um, and Natalie asked, how much did you change per iteration? Like, did you significantly rewrite it 15 times? Um, okay, so the first iteration is completely different from what I ended up summoning it. Um, so the earlier ones, I definitely expect like huge changes. So I basically rewrote my um, earlier drafts from like third to fourth and like probably fifth. But then after that, it was quite minor. But I always want to keep um, a copy of like each, each time I work on it, I just make a new, I, I rename it like, one, two, three, all the way to 15, because I think it's good, um, especially when you're reading back, it's good to uh, look at the earlier iterations and see whether, why you took it out and like what you like about it before you summon it. Um, I think that's all the uh, chat says. Oh yeah, so this here is my video on my YouTube channel um, where I talk about five things to avoid. And this is based off of a peer reviewed paper um, where the um, admission committee people actually talk about the most common things that they see and the things that they wanted students to avoid. And so that's what I talk about in this video. It's on my YouTube channel. I wish I knew. So it'd be great if you could take a look if you'd like. And yeah, so I guess before diving into that, I'd like to ask you all, what do you think are some things to avoid in a personal statement? be like anything and we can discuss I guess rambling yeah concise like being concise because you only have 500 to 1000 words most of the time so if you just have a lot of fluffiness then it's kind of bad I would say anything else you can no, also I... type it in the chat if you don't want to say anything I, I remember um, someone mentioned the question of uh, in US schools, people want you to be quirky or have this interesting story. And I, as someone who applied to like 
20 American schools, I can say that it's really important to be genuine because I think it, it can show when you when it sounds like you're not being yourself and you're trying to be someone else. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's a really good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, any other thoughts? Well, I guess this is, it's kind of more of a question, I guess, to ask, but in my mind, I feel like you should avoid, um, like overselling or underselling yourself. So I guess the question is how, like, how much would you balance that? But yeah, it's also an idea of something to avoid, not, not saying like, I am the best person for this school and should definitely be considered over everybody else and (laughs) I don't know yeah yeah for sure I think it goes back to like the show don't tell kind of idea which is where instead of saying oh I am the perfect candidate for this neuroscience course period it's maybe something like oh I volunteered for 50 hours over a semester at a neuropsychiatry ward and I learned XYZ. And then I did a research project at a neuroscience lab doing whatever. Like that would also convey the same idea that, oh, I'm the perfect candidate, um, but it's more concrete and it sounds better, I would say. Um, so that's how I present it. But in terms of kind of selling yourself, I think I was talking to some grad students while I was writing my apps and one of the students was saying like, just pack in as many things as possible while making it sound nice. Right. But at the same time, presenting it in a way that shows that you actually learned something rather than just saying like X, Y, Z, I did, I did X, Y, Z or whatever like that. So yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Um, yeah. Someone raised their hand. So. Would you restrict it to just experiences or would you like, say, for example, should I mention that I got a scholarship for something or would I just restrict it to experiences? So I could hear like, should you include scholarships? Is that the question or just experiences? Yeah. Like, should you just restrict it to all the experiences you've done all the volunteering and whatnot? Or can you mention scholarships and why you got those scholarships or should you just like avoid things like that? I would say if it's related to the criteria of what they're looking for, um, then you could. So for example, for academic scholarships, if you know that this program is super, super competitive and they really value GPA, then you can say something like, oh, I was able to balance my research experience while keeping up with my coursework, which I did successfully um, as I was awarded whatever award, which is based on top whatever percent of the faculty, something like that. Um, And if you got like a research award like NSERC or SURA, then definitely mention it because you can say like, oh, through my research award, which was funded by, you know, it also looks really good. So I would say, yeah, you can include them, especially if it's relevant. Thank you so much. Yep. I have one um, last idea. Mm-hmm. Um, what about avoiding to like putting things that are from high school or like too long ago? Yeah, so um, Typically, once I started university, I was told to remove high school stuff. So like max, like four years. Max, you don't want to go back more than four years. But personally, I wouldn't include anything from high school for a grad school app. Um, because that just looks, for me, it kind of seems like, oh, if I was the ad comms, that person just kind of ran out of things to do. So they just kind of found something from high school and put it on. But yeah, unless it's super significant, which usually isn't the case. I would generally just avoid it. I don't even put my high school in my CV now. Well, now that I'm in grad school, but I don't think I put it either for um, my grad apps or my during my undergrad um, years. Yeah, so any other questions? Yeah, I have a question if you don't mind. Yeah. So do you have any tips for gap years between undergrad and grad? especially if those years you were doing something completely different. Yeah, so um, what do you mean, like tips for? Like, should we include those and like in details or like, should we even like just avoid them? Yeah, so if you took a gap year and it was completely different, like, I mean, like completely different, then probably I wouldn't include them, but schools might ask what you were doing in that span of time. 
And I think sometimes, even if it appears really different on the outside, it might be really relevant in the sense that you could have learned some soft skills that might be useful. So it can be useful to highlight that as well. Um, yeah, I don't know if that was oh, sort of what you were going yes, at. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Sorry, so just a super quick question. What, are, what do you mean by soft skills? Uh, like communication skills, like things that you don't really learn from class like it's not like oh you learned how to use I don't know to do PCR or whatever it's like oh you learned how to communicate well you learned how to develop organizational skills communication skills um, time management skills things like that awesome, thank you mm -hmm. um, so if there's no more other ones these are my points I think are important to avoid and this comes in the editing stage just to reiterate so when you write it just make sure you have an outline and then just go for it but when you're editing, that's when you really want to think about these. So first, um, I think this is important to not do excessive disclosure about your personal life, especially if it's not for like U.S. schools, because I know someone mentioned earlier about like the quirks and things really like the U.K. I don't think wants to hear it, unfortunately. I mean, it's great, but it just is not relevant. So, yeah, that's why I would not include something like a sob story. Um, for that, for the UK. And excessive altruism, I also think is something that should be avoided. And it's also something that the um, ad comms said to avoid because it doesn't really add substance. It's something like, if you just say, I wanted to save the world, okay, <laughs> like it's kind of broad or like, oh, I want to cure something. It doesn't show much and it's not really relevant to the program in most cases, so. Yeah, I would avoid that. And for, like I mentioned earlier, it's important to show, don't tell. Um, again, for reasons I mentioned earlier, because they want to know what you learned, not what you did. Exactly. Yeah, and next slide, please. Yeah, so I would be really careful to make sure that everything you say in your personal statement focuses on yourself. So oftentimes I read a lot of personal statements that are like, oh, I learned from my friend's experience or my friend's experience really shaped me to do whatever. Well, I guess it's okay, but it makes it quite ineffective because if you were to imagine and put yourself in the shoes of the ad comms, would you be interested to learn about the applicant or would you be more interested to learn about the applicant's friend or the applicant's mom? It just creates another level of distance um, from between you and the ad com person, right? right? So the person reading it wants to get to know you, not your friend or your whatever, you know? Um, so that's just my point on that. And that's definitely something I had to learn through my edits. Um, so that's why I'm putting it there. And yeah, be positive. I think it's important to always share what you've learned in a positive light, whether or not it was something that you truly enjoyed. Um, so along that, I wanted to ask you all, what do you think about name dropping? Do you mean like if you worked with an esteemed professor in a field or? Yeah, you, yeah, like exactly that. Um, because I've also read some of the cases where, oh, um, someone's like, oh, I was at whatever undergrad institution and they were terrible because whatever reason. But then I also read some people are saying like, oh, I worked at so-and-so's lab. So what do you think about both of those cases? I feel like you should never put your old institution or whatever experience in a negative light. Because you can always just say you learned that you didn't want to do X, Y, or Z from it. And then I feel like if it's like one of the top people in the field and you were able to work for them, then that gives credence to like your ability. Yeah, thanks. I think um, that's exactly right. I personally would even put any researcher's lane that you worked with because it really shows like verifiability. So the a person can actually reach out to them and ask them how you did. So it's a good way to um, really develop like a connection. Um, and also, yeah, I wouldn't include anything bad. Even if you didn't enjoy the research experience, then I probably wouldn't put it at all because people 
in an interview can ask you about what's on your personal statement. And oftentimes when we're feeling quite stressed and in a pressured situation, we kind of just say what we feel and we don't want to convey anything that's not positive and not optimistic. Well, that's my take at least. So if it's not favorable or if I didn't like it or if I didn't learn anything from it, I would not put it at all. And lastly, I think the biggest mistake is simply starting too late because I know when I make plans, sometimes things get delayed a bit. So just give yourself extra, like literally probably an extra week or two beyond what you originally set yourself um, the deadline to do. Can you just repeat for us what your timeline was? How many uh, days, weeks, months you gave yourself? Yeah, so, okay, going back to third year. And third year in March, no, when was the poster presentation? It's like, um, whatever that was, I was joking with a friend saying, oh my goodness, I'm going to fly to grad school. And that never really came in my mind. But then fast forward, I think the end, um, a few months later, I actually wanted to, <laughs> wanted to apply. Um, so I started working on my person. Well, I, I started to look for like schools and things like that, just to see whether I want to do a master's or PhD in July-ish. Um, I came up with a very, very generic personal statement by August and stuff. But at that time, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to apply to until the fall 2019 semester when I took my course with, an, uh, with Dr. Regsdale. And that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to do neuroscience. And then I tailored my personal statement that I had back from August with that. I reached out to profs in November, I believe, and the deadline was in January, and I submitted in December. So yeah, that was my timeline. Um, I think I submitted early mostly because I was trying to stand out. I think that's a good way to stand out. You submit slightly earlier. Um, and yeah, that was my timeline. And then I heard back in February, no, February, March or something like that. Um, yeah. That's my timeline. Okay, and then now we can go through an example personal statement. Um, Sorry, one last little question about the, the last section about the name dropping of, uh, yeah. of researchers that you worked with. Um, I, I obviously it like gives some authority to, to your writing. Um, what do you think about like when research, like with a, a professor who's either retired or who, you know, was top of the food chain and you were their lowly assistant and wouldn't necessarily know much about you? Like, does name dropping them kind of like permit that school to go contact them? Or you know, if, if, you, if you comment on you and not have anything particularly valuable to say, is that still worth name dropping? So you cut off, I heard, the first and end of it, but the middle part was cut off. I don't know if you can still hear me. Yeah, um, yeah, I can. Sorry. Um, okay. Where did it cut off? I can repeat it. I just, I okay. I just got the beginning last part was saying where you were saying something like, if you, I guess, were not so involved, and if they're on like top of the food chain, is it still worth name dropping? Right? Was that your question? Yeah, like if if they were ever contacted, which I mean, I wouldn't give explicit permission to because I wouldn't want to bother them. But if ever they were contacted, they would probably just give like some neutral, like, yeah, she worked with me, so what? Yeah. Um, is that still worth name dropping or does that like not really add value necessarily? In that case, if you have better experiences, I would probably swap the experience out entirely because if okay. they contact if they contact the prof and they're like, oh, who is that? That kind of looks kind of bad, right? <laughs> so that's why I would say name drop for um, research projects, which are usually a semester like 396 course or like a full year long course so they actually know you because if you kind of already get that sense that oh they might not know me then maybe don't put it um just for like the reason I said earlier because I think yeah, it no, actually but, backfires but for something where they would they would know you but like or you know even even excluding whether or not they would know you does does name dropping a prof necessarily mean that they can be contacted like that the school would want to contact them well it depends on the school I guess they could but I don't think the people that I don't think my school, I don't think Oxford called up Dr. Regsdale. I, I don't think they have time for that because they have so many applicants, right? Um, but I guess, does it permit them to? I mean, since you gave them the name, then I guess they could. Um, so just go in the mindset that, yeah, they could, but they probably won't. Like Monica said, they have so many applicants and 
I'm sure everyone is talking about like who who specifically they worked with um, or you know a prop that inspired them so I I, I don't think they would contact them um, but I think my perspective would be that if, if like let's say you volunteered in their labs and you were just like cleaning beakers or, or whatever and um, you can still include that and I would say still include their name just to be specific that like um, that this is like you were working in X person's lab rather than just like, oh, I have research experience. I think it's always good to be um, more specific in that sense, but definitely don't use them as your reference if, if they don't know you. Yeah, very good point. I was just going to add also, I'm not sure if this is the case with many different um, like schools or applications, but I'm pretty sure many master programs at McGill require a list of verifiers or at least a couple uh, um, names with actual reference letters. So those would be people that these that you've specifically gotten permission from. And in that case, I think name dropping wouldn't be a problem as much like at all because they wouldn't contact those people if they already have another list of people they're contacting. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's true for sure. Especially there's so many people who name drop like I don't think they have time for that. So yeah um yeah we can go through the example now just pretty quickly um this is an example of a personal statement and i'll give you like a few seconds to read it through and then maybe we can talk about some of the things we like about it some of the things we didn't like about it yeah um so to those who have read it or uh, th to those who have read it quickly, um, do you have any thoughts about the personal statement? Um, I think that they ramble, like it says here, it's, it isn't a career I have wanted to do since a particularly young age, nor did a life-changing event prompt my choice. I feel like that's, I feel like I wouldn't add that in, <laughs> like I wouldn't say that. Um, uh, I feel like they use a lot of big words, like they could have made this more concise. Like, I feel like they could have said this in fewer sentences. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, when I was reading it, the first sentence, I was like, what? Like, um, like choosing, yeah, the first sentence is technically, like, okay, but it isn't a career I have wanted to do since a particular young age. I was like, uh, that does not really show commitment, does it? But um, the person reading it also agreed. There's, a com there's author's comments on this, or, like, the... Um, at Calm's comment, and they were saying, yeah, the first part could use some improvement, um, but the experiences or, you know, the local hospital placement was quite good because it's quite concise. Um, and yeah, so that's my comments on that. Good job. Um, I have a comment about it. Yeah. I feel like maybe even just shifting the perspective, it could be kind of poetic to even say that, like, um, you know, despite the fact that medicine was not my first, like had never been on my radar, like, and then mention, rather than saying what doesn't influence you, like what was the thing that influenced you? And then kind mm -hmm. of take that as your like takeoff point. Yeah, I think so. Just, it's also going back to being positive, you know, like spin it positively. I think that would have made it more effective. Um, yeah, so in the next slide, we'll see their experiences. Just give, I'll give you a few moments to read that. And to those who have read it, um, you can let me know what you think about it. I think it's pretty passive, like it's showing, oh, I watched this and I watched that. I think you could say like, from these experience, I, I learned how to do this, even if you didn't specifically do it. Because I'm sure like, if you're shadowing a doctor and they're reading it, they know that you're not, the doctor legally is not allowing you to uh, treat people with diabetes or overactive thyroid glands. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I would have said something like, oh, I learned the importance of whatever thing, like like you said, or the importance of uh, cultivating a physician, patient, you know, relationship, you know, something that shows that you thought about that shadowing experience beyond just what you saw, because everyone knows, like, regarding a daily life as a doctor, that's literally what shadowing is, right? So it's not adding anything. So also it goes back to making sure every word or every sentence has like a purpose. 
Yeah, I agree with that. Also, but I think the experiences are good. Yeah. Oh, in terms of uh, like staying positive, also, I, I think it might just not even be necessary to say that it was a fleeting experience. Like it could just be, this is something that happened. We don't need to say that it came and went that way. Yeah, yeah I agree. Just good to just like save words. Yeah, I agree. I was, I was also going to say that like, even, even if experience is brief, like if it's important, it's important. And if it shaped the way that like, why you go into a field or the experience you have going into a field, like even if it was only a month versus six months, if it's important, it's, you know, it's worth yeah. mentioning. Exactly. I would say that as well. Um, I would also try to be more specific, um, you know, like how long or like how many hours personally. Um, but also, other than that, it's good. Yeah. Oh, I'm just wondering if some, if an experience was short, um, would you, sorry, would you suggest to either say that, uh, you know, like ig ignore it altogether and just pretend like, just don't, don't say how long it was and just explain what you got from it and just all like that. Or would you suggest even maybe mentioning how short it was, but explaining like, despite how short it was, this, I got more than I ever got out of an experience or something like that to play off of that. Yeah. If it was really short, I probably wouldn't mention it. I would just say what I learned. I'm just specific directly. Um, because you don't want something that's going to raise questions in the ad comms head, the, the people, right? You, you just want them to be like, okay, you want to flow. And it also depends on what you said previously. So if you have like, um, you did shadowing for 50 hours, you did volunteering for 100 hours, and then like all of a sudden you don't include anything at all, like it kind of looks bad, right? So it depends on like the context as well. So in general, if it's really, really short, I probably wouldn't say that it's really short unless you include hours for everything else. So then you can have something like uh, consistent throughout. I have just one thing that's uh, pertinent to COVID right now and whatnot. Like I'm doing research in a lab and I can't go into a lab because of COVID. So most of my research is done at home. Like how do I, like how do I put that in the same? I learned to write a research paper and just end it there. Like what, like I don't really have any way to like, like kind of explain my development, you know? Yeah. So like what so, would, sorry. So like what would you recommend doing in that case? Like to be quite honest, I think there's not really much you can do because you're not the only one in that position and like everyone is doing that. Like for me too, like as a grad student, like everything is remote for me right now. So it's understandable. And since the whole world is in a pandemic it makes sense that shadowing is really hard, that research is happening online. And with that, I, can, I think a good thing you can say is probably um, something along the lines of independence, of how because everything was remote, you really had to take the initiative to learn how to do a literature review and how to structure things. Um, so that just shows, you know, initiation and like other important qualities. So just spin it like that way. Um, and there's no need to say like, oh, because of COVID, because everyone understands, right? So, yeah. Um, I actually, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Um, I had a similar question, like kind of same topic about COVID. Um, it, one of the experience I was going to have, I want to go into a field that's very, that's very like global. You have to have international research experience. And I was going to have some this summer, but because of COVID, I had to come home and didn't get to do it. Is that the sort of thing that I should mention or is that does that come off as an excuse like oh yeah I was gonna do research abroad but uh, didn't get to or does that do you have any other experiences abroad so, no yeah hmm I think that's tricky maybe you can reach out to the ad comms because personally I wouldn't I wouldn't say because of COVID but um I, it depends on the school like I would reach out to ad comms and ask them um and also to kind of know the people you're kind of competing against and see what they're doing as well. <laughs> it's helpful. So I have um, a bit of advice that I got from some, uh, some people doing research now and my research uh, uh, instructor also. And basically a lot of what I've heard is that you want to focus on what you've done despite so like, despite the difficulties that arose because of COVID. So for instance, the first example of everything being online, I think that was an awesome, yeah, like 
definitely you became so much more independent, right? And also the fact that you've adapted the way you can do research in order to complete an entire research paper from, you know, the comfort of your own home. Uh, so that like just being able to emphasize how you've adapted despite the ambiguity and like, you know, despite the odds not being in your favor. Um, the same way, the same thing would apply um, with the abroad thing. I don't think it would be uh, looked at as being bad at all if you say that I wasn't able to do this. Like everyone understands, but that wouldn't add anything to the paper. So what you could potentially even do is emphasize because I, I was going to do this amazing opportunity and unfortunately was unable to do so because of COVID, I creatively thought of some other opportunities to continue to enhance my experience during this time. Like you might not even realize it, but what are you doing during this time that you would be abroad? All those things are still adding to your experience and you could derive from them some, some even new um, qualities that you might not have obtained otherwise. So just think of like, really look at the positives, like take a step back and be like, oh my gosh, I'm proud of myself and think of all those good things. Okay, I was on mute, my bad. Yeah, I was gonna say that those are really good points, exactly, like to really highlight the things that you're taking initiative to do, it's really important. And yeah, the conclusion of this personal statement reads like this. Um, I know that we're a bit over time, so thank you for staying to those who stayed, but I also understand if you need to go, so no worries, don't feel bad, just do what you gotta do. Um, but yeah, I'll just give you a few moments to read this. And when you read it, you can let me know what you think. I mean, there's a really long run on sentence that's about four independent clauses. Yeah, it's, just, uh, it's like three lines long. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's quite long. I would cut it down. I find it just, yeah, it seems really wordy and like hard to actually follow what the purpose of everything that they were saying was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this also goes to show like um, just how much, how good of a writer that we've become um, because this was actually written by um, someone just fi who finished their A-levels, which is like they're 16 and that's when people apply to med in the UK. So this is a personal statement. Yeah, on the next slide, you'll see the credits. This personal statement was from um, the medical science department. It was an example, a sample or an excerpt from someone's actual personal statement, I believe. Um, and yeah, these are 16 year olds presumably writing this so you can see, um, you know, with time, writing also gets a lot easier and a lot more enjoyable, but definitely the points you mentioned about it being a long run on sentence, um, the points you were mentioning earlier about whether it was truly something we want to include, it's all very um, relevant and they're really good points. And so, yeah, the next slide you'll see the, if you want to read the full thing, you can take it from here. This is Oxford's um, resource that they have available for everyone. And that's also where I got the personal statement from. Um, but overall, they did say that this was an effective personal statement, though there could be improvements. So that was the general take on that. And yeah, to finish, if you have any other questions, you can feel free to ask them in the chat. And yeah, or you can just like unmute. How would you conclude? I find it hard to make it strong without being too altruistic. Sometimes simplicity is even better, just as long as it relates to like your main thesis statement. I think it's good. Or you can end on what you want to do in the future and how this relates. Sorry. Oh my God, okay. Um, so yeah, you can say something like through this, um, through this program, I think it's a great stepping stone for whatever I want to do in the future. I think that's how I ended mine. Um, yeah, I think there's a question from McGill Undergraduate Research Journal. Yeah, so Monica, um, just out of personal curiosity, I was wondering why you decided to apply to schools in the UK 
Um, I know that's not really the first thought for a lot of students in the North America region. It's usually the US or Canada. So it'd be really interesting to hear why um, UK. Um, so I've always wanted to be able to go abroad. Um, I didn't end up doing a, an exchange because I switched programs, which didn't allow me to do so. But going abroad was something that I always thought would be really fun to experience. And just going back to my trip, um, when I went to London, I visited Imperial College in 2013. I just remember that feeling like, oh my goodness, I want to come to the UK just to study here, um, even if it's just for one year. And I know that's pretty like superficial, but that was like mainly the reason why I wanted to come here. And also the program length is shorter. In the UK, um, everything is actually quite condensed. Um, so for example, um, undergrad here is three years, or sometimes they do an integrated master's, which is four years. Um, so on the track of getting your, for example, we would get a BSc in four years, um, they would be getting a BSc and a master's in four years. Um, for example, for medicine, we have to apply, we have to finish four years of undergrad before we apply to medicine. They can apply to medicine for six years and be a doctor after, um, I think their high school or like A-levels or something like that. Um, so for me, the master's here is only a year and that's actually quite sh uh, a lot shorter than um, like, I think it's two years at IPN at McGill. Um, it's like half the time. And because I think it's good to just try to condense things. Um, that was also another factor I wanted to consider. Um, and mostly it was just, I wanted to come explore and learn. I know it's not the best time now because of COVID, but <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to travel and experience new things and get independence and also be able to um, experience like a shorter degree, but also like the program itself. I was al always interested in clinical neuroscience since the course and not 321. And so when I literally found a course like called clinical neuroscience, I was like, okay, applying to that. We'll hope for the best. Yeah, that's my answer to that. Let's see if there are any more questions. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I've noticed a lot of grad programs, they don't require a very specific background. Like for example, they'll say like any life science bachelors. Um, so what would you say in your personal statement if your um, undergrad experience doesn't really relate to the master's program that you're applying to? Um, so what are, do you want to, I mean, no pressure, but if you want, you can share like an example of like a field because it depends, right? Okay. Um, well, I'm not sure because I'm still trying to decide, but like mm -hmm. I'm doing a lot of research in undergrad on um, in neuroscience, like memory. But let's say I want to um, apply to like an immunology program. So it's more like on that uh, different realm of like health science. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. I think how would I approach it? Um, if you took any relevant courses, even if your major is not like, I don't know, microbiology or immunology, even if you took a microbiology course, like a single class, it's good to highlight that. Um, and I think they know that the diverse, um, that the, the cohort might be super diverse. So for example, um, in neuroscience, there's in my class right now, there's someone who's an English major <laughs> in neuroscience, right? So, and there's also people who did neuroscience. There are people who did um, psych, a lot of people who did psych, but literally there's like an English major, right? So it just goes to show that they do accept and they do like um, a diverse cohort. And as long as you're able to extract some aspects, um, of the what you did and how it relates I think it's good enough like your major doesn't have to be neuroscience to be able to do neuroscience because mine was it and yeah that's how I would do it perfect thank you um any other questions um I just have a question on, like this is recorded so is it going to be posted anywhere so like we could come back to reference it later or Yes, uh, this is going to be posted on our YouTube channel and also on our um, the McGill Scientific Writing Initiative website. So I'll add it to the chat. But you could also just find it uh, through our Facebook page. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no other questions um, on the next slide, you can see um, 
my YouTube channel, hopefully. Um, yeah, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. Um, so this is where I drew my um, personal statement do's and don'ts from. Um, I would really appreciate it if you were to subscribe. I'll leave a link in the chat. Um, so currently I'm trying to get enough watch hours. So hopefully I will be able to raise funds to support other educational charities and well-being charities. So that's my goal with it. And hopefully through these videos and resources, I'll be able to help you and provide you some inspiration towards pursuing grad studies. Um, so with that, um, thank you for your time. And hi, Brenna. <laughs> Thank you. And Monica, sorry, I just have a quick question. Uh, I want to ask you, like, is it possible to ask you after this session? Uh, because I'm sure, I, I think we are running out of time right now. Yeah, you can ask me. I will leave my email in the chat. Thank um, you. So much. I'm just going to stop our recording now. Thank you, guys. <laughs>